I could probably write a book on a number of injuries I've seen through feral cattle. But, uh, followed by the name of Mickey Finn, that was Bronco Brand and a Mick in the yard. And the rope broke and uh, the Mick opened him up and uh, of course uh, dropped one of his kidneys out and he sort of had to be patched up there in the middle of the yard. I believe we've got more feral animals in uh, Cape York now than we ever have and uh, with the vast open areas now of land that is not being managed in Cape York it's virtually impossible I believe now to clean them out. Now these cattle that you're seeing here, these run out short horns, they're all over that north country right up through Cape York, the top of Cape York You'll find them right through there, and uh, these catchers that have taken them out are doing a great job to the industry to, uh, to clean them out. Uh, the buyers that will be looking at them here today will be looking specifically for the uh, meatworks trade, uh, for boner cattle. Um, yeah, they can end up anywhere from American hamburgers to, uh, to the tables of some of the poorer countries. But uh, these, these cattle, they'll, they'll have a great uh, demand here today from the meatworks from both Meatworks, from uh, here at uh, Innisfail and down the town. I'm up here from uh, just outside Brisbane in South East Queensland uh, sourcing rodeo bulls for our stock contracting business down there. Uh, we were up here last year and we bought quite a number of bulls and uh, had a very successful strike weight with bulls that uh, proved to be good bucking bulls that we can use on the circuit down there. And uh, we've come back again this year to uh, try and buy some more, uh, mainly because we can't buy this type of bull down around home. There's a lot of feral cattle up here that uh, get shipped off the meatworks every year and uh, it's uh, reasonably easy for us to come up here and buy them and uh, take them home and try them. Um, being that they're feral, they've uh, usually got fairly bad temperament and uh, that's the type of thing we're looking for in the rodeo industry. So, that's six, uh, that's 106 cents, any other interest in them at 106 cents? So, 152, same number. A product of isolation and regressive breeding, the feral bull is a survivor with a vicious temperament. His natural predator is man, and this includes the Aboriginal, who would take his freedom and remove him from this pristine environment. Living in harmony with his beloved outback, the Australian Aborigine has learned to survive within an alien culture. For some, working and surviving in this region of harsh and unforgiving landscapes would be intolerable. Our story focuses on just some of the barefoot bullfighters, like King Arthur, a local Aboriginal elder, and two part Aboriginal sisters, aged 13 and 16, Melissa and Louise, ringers, the first line defence in dealing with feral animals. Later, we join young head stockman Elroy and his dad, Timmy Gibbo, a ringer, both with a horsemanship second to none, 
But our story begins with Michael Ross, mastering contractor on Kel Power Station. One of my job here is I, um, I got a permit from National Park to eradicate all feral cattle off off Kel Power and horses. I haven't started on any horses at the moment, but um, they got a lot of horses here to be um, got together, collected, maybe break, um, break them in, and young people can ride them or maybe sell them. Hey, you come away from that day. Come away from this. Income in this part of remote northeastern Australia was incubated through mining. Cattle were introduced to feed the diggers, and sandalwood getting was used to supplement the income of the cattlemen. Michael's father was a head stockman on Rockaby Station between Cohen and Weeper. Michael started working as a young ringer or cowboy on Wolverton Station just outside the town. Following his stint at Wolverton, he held the reins as head stockman at Kelpower Station. These were good times when the station was well managed and productive. We got too much wilderness up in this area. There's a lot of people up in this country live that we don't see very much. There's a lot of traditional owners in this country, in the Cape York Peninsula, but there's a lot of land, a lot of wilderness, but there's not much enterprises up in this, um, on the Cape York Peninsula. In the early 80s, Kalpawa changed hands, and almost immediately, the new owners stripped it of the livestock assets. Within a short number of years, it was run down, abandoned, and sold to the government, then left to the encroaching wilderness. The cattle that were left behind were lost in the thick undergrowth that this country provides. These strays have now gone feral for several bovine generations. Some have interbred with other feral cattle that have been free-ranging since the whites introduced them over a hundred years ago. This has developed a dangerous animal with size and stamina and a powder keg temperament. As a consequence, this is a force to be reckoned with and Cal Power today as the biggest, fastest and meanest feral bulls on the face of the earth. That is one aim we're trying to do, um, get Cape York up into be a viable operation for enterprise, for the traditional owners, for their country and, and in the mainstream with other, other pasture leases, other um, business people that are willing to come up and um, help us get things together. and. Um, get the Cape back up and running so we can live up the Cape here but we can make a, um, a comfortable living out of, out of what we got up here. Having to deal with difficult and dangerous circumstances on a regular basis, Michael carries himself with an aura of self-confidence and good humour despite rough and sometimes risky frontier conditions. During his years away from Cal Power Station, Mike worked on Springvale Station as a head stockman and following that, held a supervisory position on a cattle property for an Aboriginal group with interests on the Cape. Michael has returned to and occupied the run-down Kalpawa station in recent years and taken up a mustering contract with the Queensland Government to assist in the control of wild cattle and horses on this area. And the management practice that uh, been trying to put on the people that are trying to capture these cattle uh, there's a lot of issues there that, uh, you know, a lot of the people down south don't understand and uh, some of the issues are is the dangers that uh, these animals do prove and also uh, the frontier area that we've got to work in, very, very hard and rugged country and the methods that are available to us to capture these animals today are very limited and it makes it very, very hard to be able to control the feral animals under those conditions. This bush chopper muster starts with the location and flushing out of small mobs of hiding feral cattle. They are mustered onto clearer country where the ringers take over, tailing the growing herd. Many rogue cattle remain, hiding in the scrub and gullies and avoiding the sweep. The cattle that have formed a cohesive mob are walked back to the stockyards. Once yarded, some of the captive feral show their true nature. The ringers cannot afford to turn their backs for a moment. Otherwise, it may be their last encounter. I reckon they're doing a good job, mate. They want this national park to be cleaned out by bulls and nuts. They want cattle out of here so we get it out of here. I think these boys are doing best. 
And uh, it, makes, it makes me proud in here to, to see them working it. Even for my, for my old uncle, old, old Victor Highbury. Well, this is his country in here. He and me yard just not far from here. And the oldest country, that's his country in here. But when he died, he said that we're going to bury him back on his own tribal ground. And, you know, I think a lot of young people should understand about things like this. Should have come out and cooperate, you know, and help help the elderly people today. Say they're staying home and just watching people walking up and down the street where they would have been here in the bush, enjoying the atmosphere out here, you know. Wooly, as he's affectionately known, was given a new nickname, King Arthur, while working at the stock camp, highlighting the bush camaraderie that usually goes on. He's an articulate and weighted spokesperson within the local Aboriginal community. He imparts his decrees with good humour, and this is why he gets a hearing from all of differing opinion and age. Arthur was born on Mitchell Mission, now Kawanyama, the place of many rivers. He has links with two areas of land in the region through his blood relatives, an uncle and auntie. He shows the signs of tribal initiation, a front tooth removed and chest scarring. He knows where you can go and where you can't in this country. They love it. We lived on the land anyway and we love it. Well, we're born as a ringer. We're not a city slicker. We're a bushman, eh? That's right, Robert. Robert. Bushman. Bushman. A boyish sense of excitement is evident in Arthur when he's able to participate in the sometimes dangerous activity of trapping savage beasts. He loves the feel of the bush and the break away from community life. Operating the trap gates, an onlooker may see him as being vulnerable to injury. Nevertheless, he takes up his frontline position voluntarily okay. and totally disregards the danger. King Arthur is averse to flying, and when he does, he often suffers the violent ill effects of air sickness. Much to the delight of those watching, and to the anguish of King Arthur, the bush pilot usually turns on some extreme aerobatics for their amusement. Yes, mate. Uh, boys are getting excited now because they got the yards up and the actions are ready. When they're waiting for the chopper to come in to bring the cattle in. And I think the boys are excited. Yeah, we're getting excited, mate. Yeah, I'm getting excited too, yeah. I'm even getting on top of the chopper myself. <laughs> what do you reckon, Mick? Mick getting excited over there too, mate. Arthur has approved this trap site. Otherwise, the local Aboriginal support may be withdrawn. The wild cattle seem to have done very well in this vicinity. It's speculated that the black watery contents of nearby Poison Lagoon has helped kill internal parasites. We're just waiting for some more here to come in here. Pretty hard job, eh? Working this blooming gate. Yeah. <coughs> you still excited? Yeah. First time for me doing this thing, anyhow. Chad, I'm glad you've done this thing before. Nah, well, we we have been on a horseback, not on a not doing. Huh? Chopper must. Wait, the rider with oh, the horse. Yeah. We done it the hardest way now, but it's pretty good with the chopper now. No portable before. No portable is just that. Take it into the paddock and leave it there to cool off, and then <coughs> take them back in the yard and brand them. And, and today we're to the chopper, no? Eh? Yep. You got a ringer, helicopter ringing, eh? One man on the chopper. Rest on the ground and doing the hunt. Yeah, it's pretty good, mate. And here we come again. So we've got to get behind the ash and again and hard again until they come up. 
Come again and we're going to swing the gate shut again. There you come. Arthur was employed as a ringer in his youth, during which time virtually all the cattle and station work was done on horseback. Today, helicopters are used and are in some ways safer. The chopper is the lifeline to civilization, and bush ringers believe it's better for them to be hurt than see a chopper pilot injured or killed. My dad's been wounded really bad by bulls. What yeah. happened there? Hey? What happened there? Here. No, he's your dad. He's on a rail. He's working in the, in the yard with a drunken fella, Aboriginal fella in it. And the bull come up flat out and into dad's pen. Um, the drunken fella shut the gate on it, the bull. Dad turned around and he didn't know um, the bull come back and stuck him straight between here, in the back of the leg, straight out through the groin. And I pegged him through the back of the leg, right out through the groin. He's got a scar about that long in the back and about that far in the front, comes straight out the front of his leg, pegged him up on the rail. What, the horn? The horn did. And he grabbed, it, grabbed hold of the rail and pulled himself off the horn. And then Uncle Doug and all the other uncles had to carry him home. Melissa and Louise are attractive, young, part Aboriginal daughters of a remote cattle station leaseholder situated in the Cape York wilderness. The lease will expire in less than 10 years, when the girls may exercise a maternal land rights claim. For the moment, they make a significant contribution to eradicating feral cattle. Uh, it just frightened me, I never did it before. <laughs> um, I hit the bully by the head, hit, hit him head on. He picked up the bike and it wore up and I got a fight because I never did it before. And I, um, our uncle, I thought it was my bike still light. And our uncle come up and he did the same thing and it's just the bike. He reckoned you just got to be careful sometimes. They might lift the bike clean, keep going. You got to be ready to jump off. Existing in extreme isolation is not easy. Indeed, at times, the isolation is unbearable. Yet these young girls manage quite well highlighting many of the advantages of life in the bush. One of the pleasurable constancies of the year is the regular arrival of the Thursday mail plane, bringing with it news from the outside world and the friendly mail lady, Adriana. And for you, if you're interested. What's up? Well, I bought those books out. Yeah. Books on those Indians. They're going to be a bit heavy going, I think, but anyway, can have a look at those. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Richard. There you are. Good. Here you are. How you going? Anyway, I haven't seen you for a oh, long time. Oh, good, yeah. <laughs> 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 hey, Melissa, thanks for that. There you go. The dogs are all looking forward to seeing you too. I kind of had them away from the aeroplane. That's all right. They're the photographs. So listen, can you guys use one of these? Now, you may or may not. I don't mind if you don't. For anything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? yeah. I gave you each one. The one for yeah. Rob too. I think. Oh, actually, I actually did. Well, or Lisa. Sorry. I thought give one to you guys. Girls, if Rob wants one. Love Adriana has become That's a great family today. friend, and not only provides news, but books, mangoes? photos, and uh, presents for the girls. Oh, they in turn provide generous samples of their cooking. A regular feature being mango cake. This culinary delight is a result of an extraordinary surplus of mangoes from the 200-odd trees grazing their property. The wet season, lasting for up to seven months of the year, brings with it flooding creeks and impassable roads, and an isolation that would drive most teenagers balmy. Melissa and Louise are never lost for contact with the outside world. Uh, you can listen to the wireless, uh, the telephone, or you can turn a radio on, radio, and listen to that wireless. And we also have the mail plane that comes, comes in, in every, every week. Thursday. You can get tourists on the mail plane that stay for half an hour and you give them a smoko. And that's where you get all our things from Reebok on the mail plane through the wet. We usually entertain the tourists by... Um, having horses and cattle and 
our emus and sometimes we have cattle in the yards and take them out and show them all the different animals and stuff. Take them for a drive in the bull catcher. Yeah, take them for a drive in the bull catcher. The girls' young working lives unfold as they help their dad make final repairs to the bull catcher vehicles yeah, and load the Whoa, camping gear. Very soon, they'll travel some 50 kilometres through the bush at night to establish a stock camp and their part in the barefoot bullfighting. Most feral bulls during the chase get so savage that they turn on the pursuing vehicle, ramming it time after time. On board the ute, the pendulum continues to swing between humour and intense defensive reaction. The confident and competent Elroy is challenged on this catch and gets cut off while on foot out in the open. The only thing between Elroy and the next flying doctor's mission is a tree. He lashes out at the fiery animal with his hat. The bull spins around as the other ringers watch in amazement. Elroy positions himself at the back of the tree and chooses this moment to run and jump to safety. Elroy is a youthful head stockman and a talented rodeo rider who is following in his father's footsteps. Well, my son, he held a all-round cowboy for six years. He was riding when he was six, riding calf. Yeah, it's in the family. Blood, yeah. All of my boys riding, but none of them good as him. I reckon he's the best. Willie Banjo is the local cattle company manager. His concern is that feral bulls are responsible for killing docile domestic stock. Willie is trying to reduce the inferior genetics of the cattle on his patch by catching and exporting as many feral cattle as possible. Under Willie's management, there will be little use for horses in handling wild cattle. He feels that rider and horse are too vulnerable to serious injury or death. Good management of herd numbers is also important. That's why we are uh, trying to bring our stock down the, to uh, the numbers. We normally have around about probably nine, nine and a half thousand head on the property yeah. itself. Yeah. Uh, the majority of them is clean skins. That's yeah. why we got to sell those cattle off. Uh, and it's good too, it's putting um, interest in the stock works and uh, showing that us own people, we're, we're running a business here, the cattle industry for, for Kiawanyama. Otherwise, if it wasn't for us, well, you know, we don't want... Uh, white people to come here and run a business for, for our community, we want to run it ourselves. And it's putting interest in young people. So I can show young people, you know, how to look after their stock properly than what it normally used to happen. We never had those, um, young people never had an interest in doing those sort of things. But now I'm here, 
they got a lot of interest because I, I teach my people how to run a, a, a business for the Kawanyama Community Councils. Today, Australia's Cape York is an isolated frontier of enormous beauty with great rivers, permanent lagoons and many forms of dangerous wildlife. Its isolation is enhanced by a prolonged wet season that guarantees safe refuge to all its animals. That includes the feral bull, a product of isolation and regressive breeding. The feral bull is a survivor with a vicious temperament. His natural predator is man, and this includes the Aboriginal who would take his freedom and remove him from this pristine environment. Sure, it's, it's the only um, wilderness area up in the. Um in Australia, as I, I as I know, and um, but that wilderness don't help us live up here financially. Mm -hmm. We cannot live on uh, wilderness. Mm -hmm. We cannot live on on grass. Mm -hmm. We cannot live on leaves. We have to have funding, some sort of money coming into the family to live. We ain't gonna live um, leave the peninsula. We we bred and born up in this country. And that go for both white and black um, people. We like the Cape, we live here, our children are here, but we, we're making no money up in this area. we got big land, we got opportunities up in this country, but we're not making full use of them. And that's one vision or one plan for us to try and get something together to do it. And um, if we can do that, Cape will come alive again.